Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, this is a happy day because it's Sunday. We get to worship the Lord. There is a little unhappiness mixed in because my favorite football team lost. <laughs> but, you know, football games are way down here. The glory of God is way up here. So we'll focus on that. Um, as we pray to open the service, I do want us to remember uh, Bob Toro. He's been in the hospital for a while. Um, they told him he needed to do some dialysis, give him kind of a uh, head start on some of the things his body needs to get doing. And he's done, I think, two treatments already, and they both were really hard on him. So uh, we want to pray for that. And this morning he was moved into intensive care uh, because of some issues or whatever. So we want to remember Bob in prayer both today and uh, later today and through the week. Um, if you would. So let's start in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we lift up Bob to you. Our beloved brother, I pray that you would heal him, Father. I pray that you would take away this pain, that you would enable his blood to do well with the dialysis and the kidneys and whatever he needs, Father. I pray that you would be with him even now. Help him to feel our love reaching out to him as yours always reaches out to him. We also uh, lift up Sarah, who is moving or has moved to Schenectady for rehab. I pray, well, first I just thank you for all the progress she's made in the last week or two for the time off the ventilator. I pray that you would continue to heal her in all ways, help her to, uh, to get strong again. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we lift up this service to you, whether we're celebrating or, or sad. We know that what you did for us can never be uh, talked about too much, can never be celebrated too much, and uh, Thanksgiving was a holiday that even our country um, celebrates, but Lord, we live in Thanksgiving all the time to you. So Father, I pray that you'd receive our worship, our praise from our hearts and minds, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel, strength and consolation, hope of all the It is 
the first Sunday of Advent, so we have a video for you to watch right now. You can have a seat for a minute. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the son praise the spirit To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me praise the father praise the 
Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever to the King of kings. Come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night. And as dark shadows put to flight, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou wisdom from on high, and order things far and nigh. To us the path of knowledge show, and draws us in her ways to go. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Desire of nations bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid thou our sad division cease and be thyself our King of peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. You are with me, what can separate us? You are for me. What can stand against us? Your love, it won't let go. I know it won't. Darkness, shadows have no power over me. Fear is friendly. Shame has no authority. Your love, it won't let go. I know it won't. I know your thoughts, your plans for me are good. I know you hold my future and my hope. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Healing and freedom as you speak favor over me. Faith is breaking all impossible. 
invincibility. Your name has overcome. Your name alone, I know. Your thoughts, your plans for me are good. I know you hold my future and my hope. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. I am standing on every promise that you make. I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. Jesus, I will trust every word I hear you say. I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. I am standing on every promise that you make. I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. Jesus, I will trust every word I hear you say. I will see it come to pass in your name, in your name. standing on every promise that you make i will see it come to pass in your name in your name jesus i will trust every word i hear you say i will see it come to pass in your name in your tell that again i am standing i am standing on every promise that you make i will see it come to pass in your name in your name jesus i will trust every word i hear you say i will see it come to pass in your name in your name i will see it come to pass in your name in your name i will see it come to pass in your name in your name i know your thoughts your plans for me are good i know you hold my future and my hope your promises never fail your promises never fail your promises never fail your promises never fail lord we do stand on your promises we stand there and nowhere else hallelujah lord you are trustworthy you are faithful you are true you are true in everything you've ever told us we believe it in jesus name amen hallelujah um lauren wants to give us a recap of operation christmas child good morning um so last week uh well from the november 15th through the 22nd um, was national collection week for operation christmas child and I wanted to share with everyone about the incredible week that it was. Um, over the course of, from the 15th through the 21st, we here at Redeemer collected over 4,000 shoeboxes, which is amazing. On the 22nd, we collected over 6,000 shoeboxes in one day. We had nine processing center, other processing centers coming in, and we had just dozens and dozens of um, people coming in that had one box, two box, five boxes. Um, it was amazing, and it was crazy busy, <laughs> but it was incredible. And for the first time ever, our goal is always to hit 10,000. Sometimes we get a little bit over, a little bit less. The first time ever, we almost hit 11,000. We were 26 shoe boxes short from hitting 11,000. That's amazing. Um, we always order two trailers, which sit out there, two 28-foot trailers. They were absolutely filled front to back, floor to ceiling, completely full. 
uh, we have more shoeboxes that are still in the fellowship hall that are waiting to be picked up to be shipped. Um, so the trailers were literally overflowing. There wasn't enough room for all of the generosity um, that was <laughs> shown over the last week. Um, it was just absolutely incredible. And there were so many people here at the church that spent um, a lot of time. Jamie uh, Miller was there. Bob, or Bill Lonis was there. Um, Becky, Cosma, just so many people, the Burgess family, <laughs> the Ragonizes, there was just so many people that showed up um, and were present mm -hmm. and were um, just serving because they love to serve, and it was wonderful. So I just wanted to thank you and congratulate everyone on this incredible um, thing that happened, and I hope um, that next year we hit that 11,000 mark. So thank you so much. Mm. Um, guys, can we clap one more time just for Lauren? Um, yeah, you know when people say, oh, I couldn't have done it without you? I don't think we could have done this without Lauren. Um, today's gopher story is in memoriam of my football team that lost. As you'll see, once upon a time, there was a town called? And in Gopherville, there's a gopher named... Well, as you know, gophers celebrate Thanksgiving. They're thankful to God for his love and kindness, his grace, and his mercy. They eat, on Thanksgiving, watermelon, lots of watermelon. They stuff their watermelons the same way humans stuff their turkeys. And as they gather around the table, someone lifts the top half off the bottom half of the watermelon, and who knows what's inside. The only thing that rivals the grand revealing of the watermelon is the watching of football on TV. Father loves to watch football, and his favorite team was undefeated. He and Gilly Galley were planted on the sofa, and the game was very close. Mother was in the kitchen getting everything ready. Silly Sally was setting the table. She didn't really like football, but she did like the big Thanksgiving feast. Finally, everything was ready and the table was set. Father had his eyes glued on the TV. The game was tied. Gilly Galley also liked watching games with Father, but this one was too close. He was so nervous that he was sitting on the back of the sofa. Mother called out from the kitchen, Here comes the watermelon. Everybody sit down at the table. Silly Sally turned out the lights to make the entrance more dramatic. At the same time, there was three seconds left in the big game, and the other team was about to kick a field goal which would win the game for them. Father was holding his breath and trying not to move. Gilly Galley was doing the same. Father turned the sound off the TV because the suspense was just too much. Mother assumed everybody was sitting at the table, and she walked into the dark room carrying the watermelon. It was very dark. She was halfway to the table when several things happened at once. The other team kicked the field goal and won the game. Father screamed, no, and threw his hands up in the air in horror and sadness. Mother couldn't see where she was walking because it was so dark. Gilly Galley threw himself backwards off the, the sofa onto the floor in dramatic agony. But he didn't hit the floor. He hit Mother, who was walking behind the sofa. When Father yelled and screamed, no, it scared Mother, who started to drop the watermelon. And that's when Gilly Galley threw himself into her, and the watermelon went flying onto the table as Mother let out her own scream. The watermelon broke open, and fruit and nuts went flying through the air, and most of it landed on Silly Sally, who was then screaming herself. Father heard all the screaming and thought something was terribly wrong and jumped over the sofa to the rescue. But by then, Gilly Galley was trying to stand up to figure out what had happened, and as he reached out to help Mother, Father came crashing into both of them, and all three rolled onto the floor right into Silly Sally's chair, which caused her and most of the Thanksgiving feast to fall down onto the pile of gophers. It was so, also unexpected, and so dark, and so scary, and so sad, that there was an eerie silence. That's when Tilly Tally and Dilly Dally, in their first Thanksgiving ever, both yelled, No, just as they'd heard Father scream it. It was their first word, and they both said it at the same time. The whole family stopped and looked at the twins. The twins laughed, and then they all laughed. Silly Sally, looking some of the fruit off her face, said, Well, I guess we won't forget this Thanksgiving for a while. And the twins let out another, No, the end. All right. Um, if you look in your bulletins, there should be an insert. 
And uh, hopefully you got your bulletin and insert as you came in this morning. If you're watching from home, uh, you can find that same bulletin and insert on our Facebook page or on our uh, website, myredeemer.com. And you know, on the cover of the bulletin, isn't that beautiful, the cover of the bulletin? I think Kathy makes the best bulletins. Um, is the, the verse, they will soar on wings like eagles, they will run and not grow weary, they will walk and not be faint. And there's a picture of an eagle. And that's, um, that's a promise for us, that uh, that's what we will be soaring like eagles. The problem with soaring like eagles is that sometimes in life, you don't quite feel like an eagle, and you definitely don't feel like you're soaring, you feel more like this. trying to soar. And then after trying a lot, you look like this. Exactly. All right, so I, I call this sermon, How to Soar. We do the best we can. And I am going to give you four uh, steps on how to soar. And the first one is to see God's glory. The second one is to own up to your sin. The third one is to accept his love And the fourth one is to reflect his glory, so they actually, if you look at the first letter of all these, they spell sore. So the first thing we're filling in, if you're filling in the blanks, it says, see God's glory and own up to your own sin. Now, if we're going to fly like eagles, this is the first step. See God's glory and own up to your own sin. I'm going to start with a story of Isaiah, who saw God, he fell down, God was holy, and he knew he was unclean. From Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Um, I think we ought always to try to see the glory of God. We can see it um, in Scripture. We can see it Uh, during worship, see it with our spirit more than anything else. Um, And seeing that glory of God, the reaction that we have, almost everybody's reaction in Scripture is, woe is me, I'm a sinner. Because when you see the glory of God, His holiness, His perfect love, His sinlessness, His righteousness, the first thing that we realize is that that's not us. We are really far away from that. We are full of sin, not sinless. We are not righteous nor holy. That's the first thing to see, and that's even what Isaiah saw, and he wrote a really long book of the Bible, so you know. All right, all of heaven falls down all the time. From Revelation chapter 7, it says, All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. You know, the picture is that, that all the creatures of heaven, they're falling down before the throne of God all the time. We just see it. So I guess at some point they stand up again because pretty soon they're falling down again. So uh, that's their reaction. And as, as far as righteousness and holiness goes, I'm kind of thinking that those creatures in heaven, the four living creatures, all the angels and all the ones that we see it in Scripture, they're probably even better than we are. And if they fall down at the holiness of God, we ought to as well. Even demons fall down before the Lord. From Luke chapter 8, it says, When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. So, if the demons possess this guy, 
and controlled him or made him do stuff. I don't know how that works. He falls down before Jesus, and even the demons speaking through him recognize that he is Jesus, son of God, and they fell down before him. We're going to see just about everyone and everything falls down before Jesus in Scripture, and we're definitely told that when he comes back and the great judgment happens, every knee will bow. Unbelievers saw God move and got saved and fell down from 1 Kings 18. It says, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him. He repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the, the, the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seahs of seed. And in case you're not familiar with this story, um, Jezebel and Ahab are in charge of everything, and they've got a bunch of bad priests who are worshiping Baal. And um, Elijah says to all the, the leaders of the nation and all these priests, listen, there's only one God. It's, it's the God of Israel. It's the Lord. And you guys are way off base. And they said, no, we're not off base. And so he said, okay, let's, let's just see whose God is listening and, and more powerful. So why don't you set up an altar and put a sacrifice on it and ask your God to come down and consume it all. And uh, the, these bad priests of Baal do exactly that. And they cry out and they want their gods to come down and do something and nothing happens. And um, they're cutting themselves even. I don't know how that, why they thought that would help. But they do everything they can think of to get Baal to, to show up. And uh, Elijah you know, I don't want to say anything bad about Elijah because, you know, he's Elijah. Um, he goes, hey, you should scream a little louder. Maybe your God can't hear you or maybe he stepped away. And, and so they just go crazy and nothing happens. So the story we're reading is when all those prophets of Baal give up and quit and Elijah takes over and says, okay, now come and see what my God's going to do. And he sets up his altar and he does all the things that I just uh, named, including building a trench around the altar. In verse 33, he arranged the wood and cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Now, if you're trying to get something to catch on fire, this is like the opposite of what you would do for natural fire to catch something, right? Elijah is so sure of the faithfulness of God, so sure that he heard God speak to him and say, do this, that he, he does something so that everyone knows and knows and knows that it's God that's going to come. It's not like he snuck a little match underneath the bull and that's why it caught on fire. So they pour four large things of water all over the sacrifice, all over the wood. Trying to catch wood to catch on fire when it's wet is not easy. And it goes all over everything. And then he says, do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. So like a moat around a castle, there's this giant trench with water in it. The bull parts are just drenched in water. The wood is all watery, and the altar is all filled with water. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, that you are turning their hearts back again. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful that Elijah, he doesn't just say, okay, do it, God, come on, make me look good. But he talks about God looking good by what he's about to do and that the purpose of this is to turn the hearts of Israel back to God because the hearts of Israel had been swayed off course into this Baal worship because of Ahab and Jezebel. And he says, no, God loves Israel enough that he wants to bring them back and to turn their hearts back again. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, 
the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Now, these are the people that were just minutes earlier all Baal worshipers. And they were, you know, laughing at Elijah, and they were hoping that the god Baal would come down and lick up all the... None of that happened. So it's like instantly God turns their hearts, and he does it through power. I think he was, he's been reaching out with love ever since the Garden of Eden, but sometimes people miss the love, and they need a show of power, and that's what God gave them. And what happens when God shows up and everybody goes, that was God? Well, they all fall down in worship, and they realize the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. No question about it. All right, I want to end this part with uh, Peter seeing God move. He also sees his own sin, and Jesus lifts him up with love in Luke 5. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Hold on just a second here. So they were fishermen and they'd fished all night. Now it was daytime and Jesus wanted to talk to the people. But the people were so numerous and crowding around him that he just couldn't find a way to talk to all of them at once. So he sees the boats. He goes down to where the boats are. And where is Peter and his friends? They're somewhere washing their nets. Maybe they're washing, maybe they're in the boat washing the nets. Maybe, I don't know. But that would make the most sense to me. So they're, they're washing their nets because they're done. They have a whole night of fishing, caught nothing. They're depressed. It's like watching your football team lose. They're depressed, and they wash all these nets. Thank you for that smile, at least. Um, And uh, Jesus said, hey, can can I use your boat to talk to the people? And Peter goes, yeah, whatever. So I can imagine that they put out a little bit, and Jesus starts talking to the people, and Peter and his helpers are washing the nets still, maybe in the back of the boat. He's in the front of the boat. Maybe they're in the back of the boat, something like that. So it's really hard for Peter not to hear whatever Jesus is teaching. So Jesus talks and talks and talks and talks and talks, and Peter, either covertly or overtly, hears and hears and hears. And then when Jesus is done talking, maybe Peter's done washing the nets and going to put them away for the next fit, I don't know. But then Jesus turns to him and says, hey, uh, why don't you push out a little further and let down your nets? And Peter's like, Lord, We've done this all night. There's no fish out there. We know. We've tried this for hours. There's nothing out there. But since you said so, we're going to do it. And I don't think if, if Joe Schmuck was in the boat with him and said, hey, go out a little further, that he would have done it. But because he had listened to Jesus all that time preaching, I think he had some respect, maybe at least curiosity. And, and so he said, okay, I heard what you said. It sounds pretty good. And, and let's, see, let's just see what happens. So he says, okay. Um, I will let down my nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Now, I'm pretty sure that Peter knew he was a sinful man before this whole day even started. But somehow, when they saw God's glory breaking through, then he knew that Jesus was something special, and he definitely wasn't. That Jesus either was God, the Son of God, or at least had God's ear, and he didn't. That when he looked at who Jesus was and he looked at who he was, there was a big chasm in between. He says, Lord, go away from me. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. By the way, let me just stick this in. We're not reading this story today, but the first miracle that Jesus ever did was what? Who knows? Yell it out. Water into wine at Cana. Yep, they get invited to a wedding at Cana, 
and they go. Jesus shows up with his disciples. Uh, they have a bunch of wine, and maybe there were too many people, or they drank too much. I don't know, but somehow they ran out of wine. And Jesus' mother says, hey, can you do anything here? And he's like, oh, I'm not quite ready for, oh, all right. So he turns the water into wine. It's a, it's a wonderful story, and it's really hard to read that story and then decide that Christians should never drink wine. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. But at the end of that story, it says, and this was the first miracle that Jesus did and thus revealed his glory. That's the last verse of that story. And thus revealed his glory. And what I glean from that is that when Jesus was here, the glory of God peaked through, shone through, came like a flood through. I don't know how you want to picture it, but it came through when the supernatural of God touched the natural of earth. When the supernatural of God turned water into wine, that revealed the glory of God. The glory of God was always in Jesus. It was there at the birth. It was there when the angels were singing and the shepherds were hearing and all that kind of stuff. But it really shined through when he did something miraculous. So we're back to this story. He does something miraculous with fish, and Peter says, I'm a sinful man. Uh, because they were astonished to catch a fish they had taken, verse 10. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Uh, wow. What does Jesus say? Don't be afraid. What a funny thing to say. Jesus, I always pictured him as kind of a mild-mannered, soft-spoken type of guy, and he's a teacher. You know, he's not like a great warrior or anything. He's a teacher, and he's out on the boat, and he's teaching, and then he just say, hey, drop the net. Why would Jesus say, don't be afraid? Well, because when we come in contact with something supernatural, our first reaction is to be afraid. Be afraid because there's a holiness there and not here. Uh, be afraid because, you know, there's something here that you can't stand up to. In a, in a confrontation, I mean, whatever, when something amazing, huge, bigger than you, more powerful than you is right in front of you, being afraid is the first thing. And when Peter falls at his face, face and says, hey, I'm a sinful man, don't, you know, move away from me, move away from me. P Jesus doesn't want to move away from him. If anything, Jesus wants to draw closer to Peter. And I think if he had taken a few steps toward Peter at that moment, Peter may have just recoiled or hid his face or dropped down lower because he was afraid. So the first thing Jesus says is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You're not in danger here. Nothing bad is going to happen here. You're safe. You're okay. Don't be afraid. And then from now on, you will catch men. And of course, we understand that totally. We're fishers of men. We get that. We're going to we uh, cast the net for Jesus and pull people into the kingdom of God. We get that. Um, but Peter, I don't know what he thought about that statement. Catchers of men? Like, are there going to be men out in the water and I'm going to drop my net and pull them all in or something? He, he really doesn't have all the, the hindsight that we have after we read the whole scriptures and then we say, oh yeah, we know what that is. Peter probably didn't. But the one thing Peter did get was that his days of catching fish are pretty much over because something else is going to happen now. And this guy is the reason why. From now on, you will be catching men. So they uh, have their friends, and the two boats are trying to make it back to shore. They're, about, they're kind of sinking because the fish are so heavy. And while they're going back to shore, I have a feeling that Peter was both thinking and maybe even talking things over with his friends on the boat. And the other boat was probably pretty close, because remember, there's one big net full of fish that they can't get into the boat. So the other boat, I think, came alongside, and they tried to both pull the net up, and half the fish maybe fell into one boat and the other. So the two boats are pretty close, and their partners, James and John, are talking to Simon and whoever Simon was with. And um, they're going in, and I'm sure James and John first asked, what's going on? How'd you get all these fish? I thought we fished all night and didn't get anything. And then Peter probably said, hey, there's this guy. And I heard what he said. He's like from God. He's, 
There's something really special about him, and he just said to drop the nets, and that's what we did, and look what happened. James and John, really? What do you know about this guy? Well, he's like a prophet or whatever, and some people think he's the son of God, and, and uh, he said that we're not going to catch fish anymore. We're going to start catching men, and James and John, like, really? We're all going to start catching men, really? And so by the time they get from where they'd pushed out a little bit to collect all these fish, back to the shore, they had decided that they weren't fishermen anymore, that they were something else. In fact, they felt like even this huge amount of fish that would have really netted them a lot of money at the market that morning um, wasn't even, it wasn't even worthwhile to, to start bringing the fish in and count them and get them to market and all that. So they just leave it all. Now, I don't know, I, you know, I wasn't there. There are parts of the story we don't get what happened next. So maybe uh, more of their friends came and, and James and John and Simon and whoever said, said listen, uh, we're going to go hang out with Jesus for a while. Can you take care of the fish? And they, oh, yeah, we'll take care of the fish. And maybe they did. Um, I don't know. But it says they left everything, even the boats. Even if they left them in the hands of their friends, they left everything for Jesus. What they're saying is being with this guy even though we're exhausted, we've been fishing all night, being with this guy right now is more important than anything else we could be doing. They saw the glory of God. Jesus said, don't be afraid. You're going to be catching men. And they pulled their boats up on shore and left everything and followed him. All right, so if we want to soar like the eagles, uh, the first thing we want to do is to see the glory of God. Keep your eyes open. Miracles are happening all the time, all around you. You may not see it. You may not uh, f- know that it's a miracle. You may not think about it until later and say, wow, that was a miracle. You know, I could tell you times when just by my driving I should be dead and something strange happened and I didn't get into a car accident when it really looked like I was going to. And at that moment I thought, whew, that was close. But years later I'm thinking, God really saved me. God really saved me. That was the miracle of God, the glory of God coming. So the first thing we do is to see that God's glory and then admit to our own sinfulness. It would be stupid if we said, yeah, God does good things for me because I'm a great guy. That's not the right reaction. All right, the second thing is to accept his love. Knowing our sin, he still loves us. You get that? We see the glory of God. We own up to our sin. God already knew our sin the whole time. Now we know that we're sinful, and we know that he knows that we're sinful, but even knowing our sin, God loves us, and we need to accept that love, which sounds easy, but it's not always easy. There are some people so ridden with guilt and shame for whatever reason that it's hard for them to understand that God loves them. Oh, but you don't know what I've done. I don't know what you've done, but God knows exactly what you've done and loves you right through that. Wow, accept his love in Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Any religion that says, listen, you got to clean up your act because you want God to like you, and he's not going to like you unless you clean up your act, that's a false religion. It's a, also a, a, just a dreadful way to live, trying to own up to a God that you can't even see and doing stuff that you think he wants to that he thinks he, he would be happy with. That's just, that's misery. All right. The God of heaven and earth did not wait for us to clean up our act or to do 10 good deeds or 100 or 1,000 or a million. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, God reaches out to us through the Holy Spirit and says, I want you. And we respond to the Holy Spirit and God's love. And that happens despite our sin, despite what we are. Also, nothing can separate us from that love. In Romans 8, 38 and 39, uh, Paul writes to the Romans, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this mammoth love that God has for us, even though we're sinners, this huge love, uh, it can't be stopped. It, it is unstoppable. It may be for us unthinkable or ununderstandable, but there's no stopping it. Nothing can stop it. 
God's love will not fail. 1 John 4 says, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. We know it and we rely on it. You know, there's a hundred different jokes that start out, you know, so-and-so got to the pearly gates and saw St. Peter. Well, okay, there's no good theology in that. But if we were to get before the pearly gates and saw St. Peter and he said, hey, why should we let you in? There's only one right answer. The right answer is, my Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ died for me. That's the only answer that would let you in. And that has absolutely no chance of failure. Okay. His love makes us live for him. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. What compels you as a Christian? What drives you? Why do you do the things you do? Why do you come to church every Sunday? Why do you tell people about Jesus? Why do you wake up and have a quiet time? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you tithe or give money to charities? Why would you do all that? Well, the one good motivation for all that is the love of god and it's like all the people we read about that saw the glory of god and fell down when we see the love of god our response is to do the things that he would like us to do it's the love of god that compels you um and and this this is a very lowly example um but you know every so often every so often, all the time, my wife says something nice about me. We'll be home, and she'll say, oh, Bill, that was a, that was a good sermon today. You know what my response is? I think I'll wash the dishes, honey. I think I'm going to vacuum. Uh, let, let, don't, don't worry about food. I'm going to order in. You know, it's like I am just compelled. It's like the love of Jamie compels me to do stuff. Well, in the same way, the love of God, which is way stronger, purer, better, and comes more often, the love of God compels us to invite people into the kingdom of God. All right. The last one is soar, S-O-A-R, is reflect his glory. We see his glory, we own up to our own sin, we recognize and accept the love of God, and lastly, we reflect the glory of God. We are loved so that we can be filled with him and reflect his glory. Ephesians 3. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love. Whose love? God's love. Rooted. Rooted means it's down deep. Uh, It holds the tree from falling over, even in high wind. That's rooted. But it's also established. It's like, this is a real thing. It's established. It's not just a here today, gone tomorrow thing. We're rooted and established in love. That we may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What a funny phrase. To know this love that surpasses knowledge. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, that's, that's the same root word there. To know, like to really know something that surpasses knowledge. And in the, in the Greek, there's a little shade of a difference there. With, with this word know, to know the love of God, it's both uh, knowledge and experiential. You have, an ex- you have an experience that confirms what you know, okay? Do you know that um, there's electricity that goes through your house? And they say that if you were to stick something in the one side of a plug and stick something in the other side and you're holding onto it, that you'll get shocked. You know, they told me that, so I know it. But when I was a little kid, I, I took a little uh, nightlight thing and it was dark in my room, I had the nightlight, and it wasn't plugged in, and it was right by my bed, so I, I tried to plug my nightlight into the outlet, and I couldn't see what I was doing, I couldn't get it in, so I thought it would be easier to guide the prongs in if I just put my finger between the two prongs, you know, then I could get it right in there. Well, I did get it right in there, and that, I was, what, eight, nine at the time, that shock was so much, I screamed, and, and my dad ran into the room, and somehow he knew right away what had happened. Maybe he saw the nightlight. 
on the bed. Maybe he saw me holding my finger. I don't know. But you know, I now know that there's electricity running through my house. It's not something I read in a book. It's experiential. I know about electricity and how it can shock you. But we need to know God's love that surpasses knowledge. In other words, knowledge can take us pretty far in understanding that God loves us. We can read it in a book. But you need to go beyond that to know it experientially. You need to say, Holy Spirit, make it real to me. And don't just help me know love here, but help me know love here. Let me feel that love. Let me know it like I know my faith. It's not just emotions, but it's more than that. It's like my spirit is connected to the love of God. It knows the love of God. And here, Paul is trying to say this to the Ephesians. Uh, We need to know how long, wide, high, deep. In other words, he's every bit, every inch and nook and cranny of God's love. We want to know that. And we have to know the part that surpasses knowledge, that it's a, a knowing thing in our spirit. Why for all that? Well, so that we can be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, that we may be filled as if we're like an empty cup, and we get filled with the love of God. And how much are we going to be filled? Well, how about right up to the tippy top? And you know, I'm not a scientist, so I don't completely understand this, but um, water, there's something called and now I forgot what it's called. But if you ever tried to fill a cup up with water, and then you look at it from the side, it fills up to the top, but then it looks like it goes over the top a little bit because the water kind of holds on to itself, molecule by molecule. So it looks like it's a little higher than, like it should just be falling out of the cup, but it just a little bit, it just kind of holds on up there. Tenacity, there's a better word for it. Anyway, so if I'm going to be filled with the love of God, I kind of want to be filled like that. That it's not just something inside nobody sees, but I want it to be kind of showing a little bit. The love of God. Let it show a little bit in my life. Let, let the people that I run around with or, or meet even spontaneously at a store, let them see the love of God in me. That little bit, just let it hang over the top. And then every so often in Scripture, it talks about um, overflowing with love, joy, hope, peace. Let the love of God overflow out of me, then it's really visible. But not only is it visible, but it's spilling on to people all around me. Let the love of God spill all around me. Um, I, I want to give you an example, and I really don't want to say this to make myself look great or anything. Uh, um, and, and we won't even discuss my total motives here. But one day I was uh, out, outside my front door, and uh, the trash guys came up in their truck. And it was Monday, which is my trash day, and, and uh, they opened up my big old trash can, and they start pulling the bags out and putting them in the back. And I, I just felt really strongly that I was really thankful that these guys come pick up my trash. Uh, because if you get a city that doesn't pick up your trash, it's, it's a sad thing. So um, I walk out to the truck, and I say, guys, you do a great job. And I just want to tell you I am really thankful for what you do. And they look at me. And I said, I'd really just like to buy your lunch today. And I took out $20 from my wallet and I handed it to them. And they said, thanks. And I felt like at that moment, the love of God was spilling out a little bit. I really made their day. And you know how much it cost me? Just 20 bucks. And in the grand scheme of things, buying that much happiness for 20 bucks is really a bargain, right? So they left, and I will tell you, too, that for at least three or four days after, three or four weeks, my trash can somehow made it up to the house after they dumped. I thought, woohoo, good investment. Okay, but let the love of God just pour and spill out of you like that. But the, the first key is for us to be as filled as it can be, right? You don't want to be filled this much and hope that it spills over, because it's not going to spill over. You don't even want to be filled, or filled up this much. You want to be filled up all the way. What does it say? That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Everything that God has for me, all the grace and mercy of God, I want to just be filled with it. I want to know it all. I want to have so much that I can't contain it, and it's spilling out all around me. All right, we're going to end with Acts 4.31. Um, because when the Holy Spirit comes, we soar. That's how we get to soar like the eagle and all that. 
It says, after they prayed in Acts 4.31, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Uh, I want to speak the word of God boldly all the time. Uh, not only on Sunday morning here in front of all you guys like I am right now, but I'd like to speak the word of God boldly um, when I play chess with some friends of mine on Sunday afternoon. I found a group. They play together one Sunday afternoon a month. I forget which one it is. But when you see me like bug out of here uh, right after the service, it's because uh, their playing starts at 12, and uh, I'm getting to know them. I know a, f- a few of their names, and they all know mine because uh, I lost a lot last week. Um, and and I don't, I don't, I'm not really close friends with any of them, but I'm thinking if I go there every, once a month, every month for a while, then pretty soon I'm going to have enough of a foundation that I can start talking about the Lord and they might listen to me. So that's a prayer of mine. That's what I'm hoping for. And as that happens, I will feel like soaring. I will feel like I am the eagle flying around, not the turkey just, or the penguin just looking around trying to figure out where to go. So anyway, let me pray for you guys. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we do want to soar like eagles. We want to be able to share your love with all those around us. Father, I pray that all the things we talked about and all the things we saw that your people did in Scripture, we would do. Show us your glory. Show us your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hey, I know we are small in number, but our Panera bread is big in mass, so feel free to grab as much as you can.